Good evening. Welcome to the Fireside Chat. So tonight going to be doing an Ask Me Anything. Um, so if there's any issues with my audio tonight, please let me know. But I've had some feedback that there's some issues last week. So played around with the settings. So hopefully everything's uh, good to go today. So um, so welcome, everybody. Hope you had a good week so far. Thank you for all the questions that were submitted ahead of time. Um, and I'll pull them up and we'll get started here. So first question tonight, is there a way to lower the calcium score? Uh, yes and no. The goal is actually to stabilize the plaque, not necessarily give the calcium score test to go down. So thank you for uh, letting me know that the audio is great. So we're playing around with the settings, so hopefully it's going to work a little bit better this week. So uh, is 30 score on the calcium score test bad for a 60-year-old woman? Um, any score above zero is abnormal, but 30 is not high risk. Over 400 is considered high risk, and over 1,000 is very high risk. I've seen patients with scores over 7,000 before. So 30 is not bad for a 6 year old, but you gotta try to figure out why the plaque is present in the first place. You know, so endothelial dysfunction, inflammation, high lipoproteins, gotta figure out which lever to pull on to try to cool down more plaque formation. And then the goal is to get that soft plaque to stabilize. And that soft plaque can either delipidate and shrink or it can become calcified. So um, that is the goal, is to stabilize the soft plaques. Question up tonight, how, what can we learn from an echocardiogram? So great question. Um, an echocardiogram is an ultrasound of the heart. Um, and there's many reasons when our echocardiogram may be ordered. Now, so if you have a valve issue or one of the valves is stenotic or regurgitant, meaning is the valve tight or leaky, they can quantify how much uh, valve disease there is. Um, but often we're looking at the, the chamber sizes, particularly the left ventricle. How big is the left ventricle, which is your main pump? You know, how thick is the left ventricle? So if you have high blood pressure, the left ventricle can get in thickened. Um, and then how well is the heart squeezing? If you had a prior heart attack, the heart may be weakened. If you've had myocarditis, the heart may be weakened. So you can see a lot of things in the echocardiogram. It's painless, uh, no radiation, um, and you know there are ways to actually do bedside echoes. I have a, a butterfly device in my office uh, that we can use as a kind of quick check, um, you know, ultrasound, um, and then you can go get the uh, uh, formal echoes at you know, most uh, cardiovascular offices or hospitals if you need a formal echo. Question up. Person has low triglycerides, high HDL, um, which often indicates that the person may not be insulin resistant, but it's not guaranteed. They have low lipoprotein A, good. 20% population has high LPLA and increased risk of vascular disease. They have low fasting insulin and A1C, but they have calcium and plaque in the RCA and, in, and a stent. So it just shows you that it's not all about lipids or glucose. There's nearly 400 risk factors for vascular disease. It starts with endothelial dysfunction. So oxidative stress and inflammation can damage the endothelium and that leads to the process. So you can have plaque in your arteries without having sky high lipoproteins. It tends to be that you'll have more chances to develop plaque with high ApoB, but you can still have normal ApoB particles and develop plaque. So you have to figure out what is driving that. And so often looking at different oxidative stress and inflammatory markers can kind of get you pointing in the right direction. Question is, do statins make your blood sugar higher? This person's glucose readings have gone up since they started. Um, yes, it is known to be a potential side effect for some of the statins. The one that has never really been shown to do that is pravastatin, or it's been known as pravacol. The other ones uh, may have an effect on that, but it's one of those cases where it will not raise your blood sugar so much that you will become, frankly, diabetic. It'll raise it a few points from the baseline. So you have to figure out why, you know, um, you're on the statin, and, you know, is it something that you should be thinking about transferring to Pravacol or other agents, but often the benefit of being on SAN outweighs any risk that the blood sugar is going up. You can mitigate that with some dietary interventions, potentially more resistance training, control your blue light environment, sleep better, manage your stress. There may be other reasons that are pushing the blood sugar up other than just the statin. So do not stop medications without talking to your own doctors about that.
question. Can anxiety and fear make your blood pressure reading high even at home? Absolutely. You know, this is uh, a stress-induced response. Cortisol and adrenaline levels are high. So, you know, if the tiger is chasing you, you need to dump adrenaline cortisol and get away from the threat. Blood vessels will constrict during that process. So in the office, that's known as white coat hypertension. The best way to diagnose, you know, if anxiety and fear are driving your blood pressure is to wear a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor. In our office, we have the old school West Allen ones uh, where there's a cable and a box that records it, but we also have the bio patch that uh, monitors your blood, blood pressure non-invasively um, and will show you your blood pressure throughout the day and you can keep a log and when you feel that you're under you know, high stress or anxious, record it and we can see what your blood pressure is doing at those times. But yes, definitely anxiety and fear can drive your blood pressure even at home. Next question up, if you have a family history of myocardial infarction, where would you start ensuring that you have a healthy heart? This is an outstanding question, and this is what we you know, routinely do at Apollo Cardiology, my practice in St. Louis, which focuses on the early detection of vascular disease and really helping people reduce the risk of having a heart attack and stroke. So it sort of depends on how early in life that your family members had their events and where you're at currently based off of your birthday age, essentially. So if you're over the age of 40, Generally, we'd start with a CT coronary calcium scan or a CT coronary angiogram, ideally with a clearly AI analysis to look for the soft plaque in the arteries. If you're under the age of 40, we'd probably work more towards looking at the markers of endothelial dysfunction, we test like the endopat, pulse wave velocity, we test like the max pulse, just is your blood pressure less than 120 over 80, and a fairly comprehensive blood work panel that looks at lipoprotein A, ApoB, the various oxidative stress and inflammatory markers, start there first. But uh, it does require, you know, some non-invasive tests to tell you, are your arteries aging appropriately? But it's never too young. I mean, if you're 18 years old, you can still get tested for a lot of this stuff. If you're older, it's never too late, you know, but you might have more work to do once you actually uncover uh, the results. So plaque is very common if you go looking for it. You know, having an event does not necessarily have to be common. person says that they're based in New York and they're taking a vacation to Thailand in a few weeks. Any tips on how to maintain a circadian rhythm when traveling that far away? That's an outstanding question. So not too unlike my uh, origin story of how I got into biohacking and health optimization. So it was back in 2017 and, you know, if you've heard this story before, you know, uh, bear with me, but many people haven't. That's the whole reason. You've never seen me on social media without blue blocking glasses on. So I was taking a flight from St. Louis to Thailand, ultimately onward to Bhutan, but similar 14 hour flight, jet lag was gonna be pretty brutal. So came upon some articles talking about these blue blocking glasses to help set your circadian rhythms. So I bought them, the jet lag wasn't nearly as bad. And so when I got back to St. Louis, did the research and realized, oh, how important light was to controlling your supercosmic nucleus and telling the organs what time of day it is. So get yourself a nice pair of blue blocking glasses. Yeah, you know, if you don't already have a pair, you, know, you can check them out. Uh, my website, drtom.com has some links to some various ones that I personally used and know work well. Um, and then the other big one is there's a free app, at least for your first trip. You might have to pay for it if it's the second trip you've taken, but is the uh, app called um, Time Shifter. It's a app where you plug in your flight itinerary and it tells you exactly how to control your light environment, your meal timing, your caffeine, if you're taking oral melatonin, which is the one case where oral melatonin, I think is reasonable to take uh, to help reset your rhythms. Um, it helps you because you're probably gonna be very kind of fatigued out of it, you know, halfway through the trip and you're gonna kind of start making mistakes if you really wanna be optimal in your circadian rhythm management. So that the, the um, time shifter app is excellent for that. Um, you know, the, the quick and dirty is that like when you get on the plane, have a watch and set it to Thailand's time and whatever's happening in Thailand, try to do that on the plane. So if it's dark in Thailand and you're not ready to sleep, have your glasses on. If it's meal time in Thailand, eat on the plane, even if that's not the time they're bringing you food. And most of the time the food on the plane is not good for you anyway. So generally bring some good, healthy uh, protein forward snacks on the plane or fast. You know, if you fast, sometimes jet lag mitigation is a little bit easier, but that's a great question.
Good luck with the trip and let me know how it goes. And definitely send me a DM when you get back. This would be a uh, five hour podcast, but uh, you know, how to bring ApoB down. Now, apolipoprotein B is the main number to look at if you're looking at an advanced lipid panel. ApoB is on the outside of all the lipoproteins that could get stuck in your arteries and contribute to plaque, including LDL, VLDL, ILDL, and if you have it, LPLA. Most people should probably shoot for an ApoB target of 70, 70, or less. Now, there's generally three big levers that you can pull to lower ApoB. You can make less cholesterol in the liver, so you make less lipoproteins. You can do something that supports the LDL receptor and clears the ApoB particles from the circulation better, or you can block the cholesterol from being reabsorbed in the gut. So the analogy I'm using is think of a bathtub overflowing with water. The two main ways that you can help prevent the water from overflowing is you could turn the faucet off. That would be using statins, bimpidoic acid, which is nexitol, bergamot, reddish rice, fish oil, niacin. You could open up the drain, supplement-wise that's berberine, but more potently, this is the PCSK9 inhibitors. Most of the time that's repatha or prelument. There's also oesclerin, but that's a uh, twice a year IV infusion. Or you can use azetamide to open up the drain pipe and push the water out to the sewer. So you have to kind of figure out why the ApoB is elevated. Often the cholesterol balance test from Boston Heart Lab will help differentiate that. Sometimes you can also use the GB Insight panel, which is a novel uh, genetic testing that tells you why your ApoB is elevated. And you can potentially figure out what nutrition strategies, supplements, or medication are better at helping modulate ApoB. Next question up. Is it true that some people cannot reach their maximum heart rate and why not? Um, I don't know how exactly to answer this, but you know, one, the calculated maximum heart rates are very inaccurate. So 220 minus your age is really not the greatest way to measure your maximum heart rate. Your maximum heart rate is just that. It should generally be done under supervision. So either during a stress test, a VO2 max test, or with a trainer standing by. You know, if you're relatively healthy, you know, you could probably do this on your own, but you know, I can't offer medical advice through this form. So you should probably have somebody supervising you if this is kind of more of a medical related question and see where your peak heart rate is. Now, it's been a little bit since I've done a VO2 max, and I think I got my heart up to 178 the last time I did it. Um, I know I can get it up higher. You know, this is definitely um, you know, TMI, and you know, I would not repeat doing this, but back when I was in my cardiovascular training, uh, it was actually New Year's Eve um, in the stress lab, and there was no cases scheduled because nobody wanted to have a stress test on New Year's Eve. So I decided to put myself on the stress test uh, at that time. This was shortly after I got out of the military. I was still doing a lot more running at that point. Um, and you know, I went, did the stress test and was crushing it. But um, I got my heart rate up to 205 beats per minute. Um, I started seeing stars, so I shut down the, you know, the treadmill before I passed out because I didn't really feel like having them call a code to the stress lab. But that was way higher than my predicted maximal heart rate. There was no reason to go that high. Um, you know, you don't need it for any reason for cardiorespiratory fitness to get that high. I just did because I wanted to see what I could do when I was still in training. I was supervising myself. So maybe not the smartest thing, but I can know I at one point could get to 205. Now, why can some people not reach their maximum? Well, some people as they age will start developing chronotropic incompetence. Basically, the wiring system is wearing out and you can't get your heart rate up high. So if you have a low resting heart rate, sometimes one of the treatment or it's one of the diagnoses is they'll put you on a treadmill and they'll walk, run you, and see how high they can get your heart rate. If you can't get your heart rate up to like you know 120 beats a minute or higher, there may be an issue with your sinus node, the way it's talking to the atrioventricular node. Um, there's also sometimes when people have some thyroid dysfunction, especially if their thyroid is underactive, they may have more issues with uh, chronotropic incompetence. So those are some of the starting points, but it really depends on if you're symptomatic or not, if they need to do anything about that. I'm going to talk about testosterone replacement therapy and drop in their HDL, but increase in their LDL, but the triglycerides normal and glucose in good range. Um, you know, start with metabolic first. You know, triglycerides, when they're normal, that's good, but triglycerides that are normal are generally less than 80. Um, and fasting glucose should be less than 80 as well. 100 is too high. You know, um, 
for glucose. Now, testosterone, you know, may have an effect on lipid proteins. You know, it probably has something to do with the way that the LDA receptor is modulated, but I'd really want to know what your apolipid protein B or your LDL particle count is because HDL for the most part is a useless metric. Um, you need to know what the atherogenic particles are first, you know, because having a higher low HDL really doesn't tell you do you have healthy arteries or not. Somebody says beta blockers, increasing LDL, decreasing HDL, along with mild abdominal fat increase. Um, I've not personally seen beta blockers having much effect on the lipoproteins. Um, would it cause you know, visceral or abdominal fat? I've not seen that in my experience. You know, it definitely can potentially slow the metabolism down a little bit um, and can raise blood sugars, but I've not seen it directly cause uh, fat gain. Person's asking, what is the best treatment for those with genetically high, it's spelled APOE space bar B. So I will read this as that it's high APOB. Um, you know, it potentially if you have monogenic familial hyperlipidemia, um, then it's gonna be probably one of the combination therapies with a PCSK9 inhibitor, you know, moderate dose statin plus minus azetamide. Often it's two or three agents to get people down if they have genetically high APOB. Typically, you know, that's going to be ApoB is in the 90th percentile or higher, and that's probably an ApoB of 150, 160. Um, so that is probably going to require multiple therapies. But the GB Insight panel, the cholesterol balance test with Boston Heart Lab, that's my bread and butter to figure out why people's uh, ApoB is sky high. Question, how long after a heart attack should they take, I've actually looked this up, ABLE E 75 milligrams and atorvastatin 40 milligrams. Uh, ABLE E is apparently aspirin uh, and atorvastatin used to be known as Lipitor. Um, so it depends on when the heart attack was, but you know, pretty much lifetime. You know, you know, if they put a stent in, especially, uh, then it's lifetime. You know, the antipalladive agents prevent things from clotting inside the stent or in the other arteries that were not stented and Torvastatin stabilizes any of the soft plaques, lowers inflammation, helps with endothelial dysfunction. So if you can't tolerate one of those agents, they need to find something else to support the antiplatelet effect and modulating ApoB and inflammation. Question, drastic differences between day and nighttime heart rate variability results, how to improve it. Um, so heart rate variability is inversely proportional to your heart rate. So during the daytime, if you're up and moving around, you're likely gonna have higher resting heart rates, thus lower heart rate variability. And the converse is true. While you're sleeping, you're probably not moving around as much, hopefully, um, at least when you're in a room sleep. And so you should have higher heart rate variability while you sleep. Um, that being said, it's one of the cases where it's like, what you use to measure heart rate variability matters. And so if I really wanted to be a stickler with it, unless you're measuring with a chest strap, I would not necessarily believe any of the rings, watches, anything else that says that they're actually measuring heart rate variability because they're measuring your pulse wave, which is not the same thing. So if you're having results that don't make sense to you, actually get a you know, Bluetooth heart rate monitor and measure it with an app like Elite HRV and see what your true heart rate variability is. Question, is Wolf Parkinson White Syndrome something easy to find with testing? Um, generally, yes. I mean, you can generally see you know, it on a standard 12 lead EKG with an upsloping uh, PR. Um, segment, um, you know, sometimes it's asymptomatic, other times people have palpitations or they actually have episodes of supraventricular tachycardia and then they get picked up with it. You know, if they don't see it on an EKG, this would get picked up on an electrophysiology study or EP study. Um, it is something that you know, I've seen few cases, you know, in my career, I'm not uh, in that type of practice where um, most patients are coming in with palpitations, so I just don't see as much as when I was still doing more general cardiology. 
but fairly common. If you actually have both Parkinson White and it's symptomatic, it's generally pretty um, straightforward to have a ablation procedure that's 100% curative for it. So any uh, general cardiologist would be able to have a conversation with you and be able to rule that out. Question about in ApoE4 carriers, do you aim to lower ApoB more aggressively? Um, it's not necessarily more aggressively, it's just what is their goal based off of their vascular health. But often with ApoE4 carriers, it's a little bit more about what agents do you actually choose to use. Um, a little bit harder to use some of the high dose uh, fat soluble statins, those being the torvastatin and uh, uh, simvastatin. Um, doesn't mean that they can't tell you statins, sometimes they're more intermittent dose for SUVA. Um, but really want to see high levels of DHA and crush any evidence of insulin resistance in ApoE4 because of the increased risk of Alzheimer's, you know, increased risk of diabetes. So um, ApoB targets are going to be the same, you know, depending on what their vascular health is. And this is a question um, that I wouldn't be able to answer without more information, but you know, is it safe to exercise with arrhythmia? It would absolutely 100% depend what arrhythmia you're speaking of. So if it's atrial fibrillation, more likely than not. But if you're having ventricular arrhythmias, ventricular tachycardia, um, you know, we're not likely to have ventricular fibrillation, but you know, if you have ventricular arrhythmias, no, it is not safe until you're seen by a cardiologist and they evaluate you for that. So can't give that type of uh, medical device in this form. So if you have any type of arrhythmia, you need to work with your local doctors and ask them you know, what is your exercise restrictions if there are any. All right, so I think I got through all the uh, pre-submitted questions. Thank you guys, and thank you for those that are joining. Uh, you know, doing the uh, fireside chat tonight. And thank you for those that are saying that the audio is working well this week. So I try to jack up the gain on this one as loud as I could. I know a couple questions popped in in the comments, so I'm just looking for those at the moment, but if anything else pops up, just uh, drop it down in the comments below. So somebody's asking about homocysteine. Is it a good indicator? Um, they read several studies, and some of them are contradictory. So I still you know, use it routinely in patients. Homocysteine is an amino acid. When that amino acid is elevated, it will often increase a compound called asymmetric dimethylarginine, or ADMA. If you raise ADMA, that will lower nitric oxide, and more likely your arteries will be stiff, your blood pressure will be elevated, and you're set up to develop plaque in your arteries. Often, homocysteine will be elevated if you have a methylation issue, either a 1298 or 677 MTHFR mutation, either one or two abnormal copies of that gene. It can also be elevated in instances of chronic kidney disease. So I routinely measure it, as well as B12 and folate levels. Um, generally, one dome assisting at least less than 10, optimally less than 8. Somebody's asking, should you avoid protein if you've had an elevated ApoB? No, but you may want to avoid high levels of saturated fat. You know, protein by itself isn't going to affect the, the lipoproteins. You know, um, it's the types of fats that some people ingest, and that's often you know, dependent on your ApoE status. E is an echo. Also, if you have the Boston Heart Lab the, where you do the cholesterol balance test, if you're a hyperabsorber of sterols, sometimes that is an issue. Somebody's asking reasons why the heart races super fast and strong for no reason. There's always a reason. Um, it's just you have to get to the root cause of it. So, you know, blood testing, uh, heart rate monitors, often an echocardiogram to see structurally do you have a normal heart. Now we'll get to the reason why your heart is racing. Same reason. You know, why does the heart feel like it skips or pauses when exercising? You know, it may be, but you have to be monitoring to see what it actually does. Are you having premature atrial contractions, premature ventricular contractions, runs a non-sustained ventricular tachycardia? Unknown, so you have to monitor to catch what's actually happening with it. Does constant high heart rate increase mortality? Depends a little bit about 
um, what heart rate would be, but there's something known as a tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. Um, sometimes can be seen in patients who have atrial fibrillation, um, but it generally is going to be more than just uh, um, you know a day's worth. You know, it's going to be quite a long period of time before the ejection fraction starts to, to decrease. Um, but you know, a bell-shaped curve, a quote normal heart rate is between 60 and 100. But there are people that you know a heart rate of 105 is normal for them. So it really depends if you're symptomatic or if there's any evidence of any drop in the ejection fraction. Um, I don't know for sure, but somebody's asking that their teeth seem to be getting more and more yellow in spite of brushing twice a day. Can it be something to do with high calcium in the arteries? There definitely is an oral systemic link. You know, if you have a lot of tartar on the teeth, you know, that can be a marker of issues with uh, calcium metabolism. Sometimes it's a deficiency in vitamin K2 that drives that. Um, but then there is also other oral bacteria pathogens that may be affecting that as well. Um, so, like many things, you know, in life, it's test don't guess. Sometimes they're correlated, sometimes they're not. So if you've not previously had carotid scans that look at the arteries or calcium scores, then you maybe want to start there and see, do you actually have plaque in the arteries? Somebody's asking, is POTS a heart or nervous system disorder? It's kind of both. You know, for postural orthotic tachycardia syndrome, you know, people will generally pass out with this on standing. Um, definitely not my area of expertise. This is what electrophysiologists and sometimes neurologists are um, you know, focusing on to try to get to the root cause of um, so it is kind of a combination. It's an issue with the autonomic nervous system. Um, somebody's asking about what I think about Clot Thicken's book. I've personally actually not read it all. You know, I've been asked about it before. You know, it's a premise, it's a theory, but not really how well validated and doesn't really fit with uh, kind of mainstream thoughts of how atherosclerosis uh, is uh, propagated. You know, definitely, you know, when plaques rupture, they clot but it's not that it's clots driving the atherosclerotic process. That's kind of backwards. Somebody's asking, if their ApoB is 96, is it true that statins can raise this? No. Um, the only time I would raise ApoB is if it's significantly raising your lipoprotein level A, um, which that can be seen. But it's going to align to you, the statins are going to be lowering the LDL particles, and usually that's going to counterbalance it. So uh, statins should not be raising your ApoB. All right, so I don't know what this exactly means, but somebody says that their husband had a false positive calcium score, normal cath. Have you had many? Um, there's really not many false positive calcium scores, but what can happen is that the calcium score test can be abnormal, and then when they do an angiogram, they don't find a severe stenosis or blockage in the arteries. The way that can be explained is that plaque is much like an iceberg. It's growing in the walls of the artery, and only until much later does the tip of the iceberg break the surface of the water and start occluding the flow where the blood is flowing in the lumen. So it depends a little bit on you know, how high the calcium score test was, which would be likelihood of having normal cath. But I've seen patients with calcium scores over 1,000 who had, quote, relatively normal lumens. They didn't have severe blockages. They had some 10, 20, 30% blockages, but nothing severe enough that would require a stent or bypass surgery. So they did not need a procedure, but they were still high risk of having a heart attack or stroke. So they still needed aggressive treatment of their risk factors, optimize endothelial function, lower inflammation, treat ApoB. You know, so that doesn't mean that it's a free pass just because you don't get a stent. But that being said, you know, there is cases where you can also have the reverse. Your calcium score test is zero, but you have a lot of soft plaque in the arteries and still at risk of having an event. So that's where a CT angiogram is more sensitive if that's a concern. The percentage, I don't remember exactly, but someone in the neighborhood of that, you know, 10% of people with a calcium score of zero still actually have plaque in their arteries. Um, you just have to go looking for it. So it depends on their case. You know, they have high lipoprotein A, high family history of early vascular disease. They may not be feeling well that they got a calcium score of zero, you know, unless they're like 70, 80 years old. So it's an interesting phenomenon. It's just one data point. So that's why, 
you want to do other serial testing, looking at other vascular beds, and also kind of a biochemical standpoint. So I always talk about biophysical, look at the arteries themselves, biochemical, look at the blood work, and see does that stuff all make sense. All right, a couple more questions. So low-dose Tadenafil used with Nabivalol as part of a protective preventive protocol? Possible, yeah, but Tadenafil would only work if you have nitric oxide going into the funnel. So still have to exercise, still have to eat your nitrates, still have to get UVA sunlight, <clears throat> so possible. So somebody's asking, how do you strengthen a weak heart? Um, very scratch drive for your head, obviously, what is causing the weak heart? Is it an ischemic cardiomyopathy, lack of blood flow? Then send them to your friendly uh, interventional cardiologist and get them revascularized. You know, uncontrolled high blood pressure, treat their blood pressure. You know, is it a viral cardiomyopathy? You know, supportive care and hopefully the body can recover. You know, heart failure reduce ejection fraction, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, uh, medications like spironolactone, newer medications like Parxiga, um, you know, the kind of quantum, you know, integrative cardiology ways to think about it, CoQ10, uh, you know, magnesium, photobiomodulation, lots of things potentially can help it. So gotta first figure out what's causing it to be weak though. So person says that their doctor says there's no need to repeat a calcium score after years on the statin. Is there a better test option? For the most part, yes, I would tend to agree with that comment because once you're started on a statin, your calcium score test often goes up and you're not necessarily getting worse. You're taking the soft plaque and making it more firm and it's becoming calcified. So the test goes up, that's actually probably actually a good thing. It's stabilizing the plaque. So if you really want to know what's going on with the soft plaque, um, you would have to do a carotid intimal medial thickness scan, ultrasound of the carotid artery, or a CT coronary angiogram. And again, ideally CT coronary angiogram would include a clearly analysis, which is AI uh, software that looks at the total plaque volume and quantifies the types of plaques in the artery. Could a virus infection cause a high sensitivity CRP to be elevated? Absolutely. High sensitivity CRP is just a global mark of inflammation. It's not specific to what's causing it to be high, but definitely a viral infection could raise CRP. So if you've been sick and your CRP is high, repeat the CRP two to few, four weeks later and see is it going down. All right, a couple more questions and I'll save some of these to next week. So if I don't get your question tonight, just put it in the question box that I answer next week. So I try to keep these to half an hour so that you guys uh, can still spend some time with your family tonight. So, all right. Are two eggs a day unhealthy for heart because of high cholesterol? No. The types of cholesterol that you eat is not the same type of cholesterol that's floating in your blood. That cholesterol is coming from your liver for the most part. So the esterified cholesterol that you get in your diet is not going to pass your gut. So most time eggs are not a problem for most people. But again, test don't guess. If you do testing and your lipids are going significantly up after eating eggs, and maybe you're one of those odd people that it does increase it. But for most people, eggs are not the problem. All right. So somebody's saying about leaky valves. I answered that a little bit earlier about, you know, what is an echocardiogram useful for? Um, somebody's asking a question. I cannot answer this one because this is, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, but they're talking about being on a, uh, a pixaban for AFib, how long after a stent to stop clopidogrel. You'll have to ask the doctors who placed the stent on how long to be on that. Okay, so somebody's asking about how to prevent leaky valves from worsening. Um, oftentimes it's a wear and tear problem, so you don't um, have a lot of options, um, but tight control blood pressure and making sure that uh, you don't have significant inflammation, which could injure the valves. Um, that would probably be the two things top ahead. Oh, you're very welcome. I love doing this for you guys, answering your questions. All right. So, so that's the bottom of the hour, uh, the fireside chat. I'm actually getting pretty warm here, so I think I'm about to move in a minute. Um, so next Monday, 6 p.m. Central Time, we'll be doing this all over again. I'll just keep at it, doing these uh, AMAs uh, as is. But this year, the plan is to do some more long-form content 
The long form content will ultimately be on my YouTube channel. It's just spelled like this, at Dr. Twyman on YouTube. So if you don't follow me there, please just you know, give me a connection on YouTube and be on the lookout for some of the longer form videos. Um, if there's topics that you want me to discuss, that'll probably be where I'll do more of them because then I can use some more fancy audio-visual equipment so people can quote hear me better, but it also look better. And then I can have slides that I can show as well. You know, there will also be a podcast that I'll be doing this year. You know, it's going to be called Mission 106 Plus. The reason it's called that is because my great-grandmother Ola lived 106 years old, and it's my job to try to beat her. So I'm not even halfway there, but uh, in a couple of weeks I'll show you a poster of my Memento Mori poster. And when you see that you got to scratch off a week of life every time, you start feeling like you got to get things going. Um, so uh, I'll be doing the podcast uh, in the next couple of weeks. Probably most of them will be kind of like some solo podcast for all, but there's some good guests I have in mind that I'd like to get on the show later this year. Um, so if you're interested in that, just keep following me here and I'll have information of when that goes live. So hope you guys have a great week and we'll see you next time.